I'm extremely grateful to Lamsa and Dr. Alamuddin from Cisco and Shabbos Dean, who chairs lots of committees in lots of places, but um, for, for taking the time out to be here. Also, there are such, so few of us that I'm extremely gracious to each of you for taking the time out to be here, not only be here, but as I always say, be here on time. My name is Rabia Khalid, for those of you who don't know me. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of CIO Magazine. And in this particular session, um, in, as part of the CIO Year Ahead 2010, I decided to take a back seat. Because when we talk about industry issues, I firmly believe that you need to involve as much of the industry. And not only do you need to involve the industry, you also need to be able to integrate them. Which is why I requested Dr. Ahmed and tried to lead the session, as opposed to me, just so I could take a back seat and pay more attention to what role trade media should. Sure. In addition to myself, I'm also very gracious to Ahmed Jahanusa, who's here, he's the CEO of Sun. He also has an extensive uh, track record of telecom, and I wanted him to sit in as part of the panel and also talk about some of his experiences. When we talk about the theme today, it's 40 new IT business strategies for 2010. There's some issues at hand here. In the past one year that we've interacted, rather one and a half years that we've interacted with CIOs and IT heads and vendors, everybody's of the opinion that it's great. Technology really, really seriously drives business. But when we get down to it, to the consumption, I don't perhaps find the convincing figures there. And that's probably one issue which is brought up time and time again in every panel. Now, you're probably looking around saying that, why aren't certain other strategic stakeholders as part of this session? And the reason for that is, we wanted to invite very a select group of people who have a, lar a long track record as part of the industry. They have some essence, some experience of technology, and understand business in their own vertical. But uh, by the end of this session, and by the end of the three simultaneous smaller roundtables that we have planned from 2 o'clock to 3.30, we'd like to set the pretext for creating roadmaps. One of the things I fear we don't have as an industry is an industry roadmap. Where are we heading? If you talk about technology driving business, how does that happen? Hamad Siddiqui of SIDE will probably talk to you about an issue which he's been harping on for at least the number of years that I've been following, and that's about capacity building. And do we have all those things within the industry? One of the reasons for inviting people like um, Ali Hassan from the National Bank is I had a chance to have an interview with him, and that's all he talked about. How to have solid frameworks, how to have capacity building. One of the reasons I bestered my Bishisa from IBM to come is because I see him as a business leader. And I think IBM has done terrifically well in times of what we call times of crisis. And so one of the reasons for getting him into the room is just to talk about those issues. What are, the, what are your biggest challenges? What are your strategies for overcoming those challenges? And how do you, as part of the industry, and not just the IT industry, but also the banking or agriculture or networking or whatever you like, whatever industry you're in, how do you see business taking lead and being influenced and impacted by technology in the coming year? I'd also, I'd also like to make a formal welcome to uh, Shahab who's here from Open Silicon Valley. I chance to interact with him over the phone uh, for the grand conference that Open hosts every year. And we got to know one another. I'm so sorry I didn't know who you were because all you are is an email address and a voice over the phone to me. But hopefully perhaps you can talk to us about trends in the global market and how you, and what you hear from us locally. As always, we've got a panel of sponsors and supporters who enable us to, uh, to, to be here, and uh, I'd like to thank all of them extremely graciously. Before I take any more time, I would like to take my place in the panel and turn the mic over to our moderators, and Shahida or Dr. Rabe. Thank you, Rabe. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Uh, clearly, uh, uh, the moderators, myself, and Shahida, are only here to steer the discussion in a certain direction. I'm sure that the value that all of you bring to the table is far more important than I have. Uh, 
Uh, I'll just briefly start off with uh, a little bit of history. Uh, I've been around for a long while, yeah, I think I've been as well in the IT industry for a long time. But for me, this is something quite interesting that after so many years, we've actually got to the stage where people are now talking about things in a much more serious fashion. We are now looking at industry trends, we're looking at trying to gather information, gather intelligence, enable us to make plans for the future. This is something that clearly has been long debated. CIO Magazine, in particular, as of course, by Raja, has been instrumental in bringing us to the stage, I think. Uh, this is something that I've been personally arguing on for a long while, that we do need serious discussion, we need uh, interaction, we do not need lectures uh, from people who have, been, uh, who have paid to be there. Even though uh, Cisco is going to appear there, this is purely because of the fact that uh, we are part of the World Economic Forum, the World Economic Forum produces a report called the IT Competitiveness Report. Annual basis. Uh, so, that on a global basis. So, uh, this is also an important part of the first to interact with the World Economic Forum, and hence we appear to be Again, very briefly, uh, before coming to the session, I tried to interact with the CIO for Cisco, which is quite my of course, of the large company. So, I tried to find out from the CIO, from the CIO of the company, uh, I'm going to an event of this nature. What, in your opinion, are the challenges that you are faced with? And interestingly, even though a $40 billion company, and the same is probably echoed by IBM, which is probably a $100 billion company, uh, the same concerns that many of our CIOs in Pakistan express to us are being expressed by them. So, for instance, the first thing that they talk about is that we are being asked to do more or less. Our budgets have been reduced. Of course, clearly, their budgets must be multiple in our projects, and their budgets, but nonetheless, they have been reduced, and we are asked to do more. In addition, uh, something very, very important, I'm sure something that applies to us in Pakistan as well. Uh, we are being asked to demonstrate results in the sense of work value you are looking for the top line as well as the bottom line. So not just are we looking at enhancing revenue, but we are also looking at reducing costs. And the need to know the management needs to know and our guest John Chambers we strongly drive this, needs to understand what value is actually the value you're making for the overall business. No longer is it good enough to say that we have improved efficiencies and the IT function is expected to deliver, but they now want to measure this. So, for instance, in our case, we have an interesting case where we reduce the technology for tech levels, which is actually pretty comprehensive and in a very life sized environment. Not just us, unfortunately, that company is that. But internally, one of the measures for us to find this was to find out how much money you have saved. So, last year, we saved about a billion dollars in travel costs. This is about to make Now, here, the heart of it is massage. Because you can say, well, I can do that. I didn't go here. I saved $10,000 uh, on a meeting, etc. But nonetheless, the, the message is very, very clear that you need to measure results in a much more concrete fashion as opposed to that. Then we talk about improving uh, efficiencies in the organization. Uh, having said that, here we will talk more than we can, we can talk about that I think we'll do in the course of the discussion. I'd just like to set the scene. I think we've got about an hour and a two hours or so uh, of. Discussion. I uh, was asking Ravi, who was here, we had once to be around a long time. So I think what we do is have a discussion for interaction for about an hour or so, we can play. And then we can come back in after the rest of the session. Uh, with that, uh, I'd like to turn it over to Shahada. I'm Shahada Steve, and although Ravi also always introduces me as uh, the woman with many hats, uh, I'm here as the chairperson of the Standing Committee on IT. And what Dr. Ahmed just said is very true, and it's true not just for technology companies, but for all companies. Um, in the economic situation that we're in globally, all companies are being asked to do more or less, regardless of the vertical that they're in. And all companies are being asked to show uh, our advice. And that especially applies to new investments. So investments in technology are being scrutinized harder, deeper. It's much more difficult to get that yes. Um, so your customers are being faced with similar challenges. And I think that is a good place to start the discussion off. Um, I'm going to end here, but I think if we just take a moment to really think about what are the challenges that we've all been faced with over the last um, year or so, or even greater, and share them with each other and perhaps share some solutions as well. So I'd like to hand it over and we start with uh, I'm um, with IBM for many, many years now. 
uh, have been in Pakistan for the last 11 years. Was uh, in uh, IBM's Dubai office, uh, prior to that. had some regional experience of the Middle East market. We are living through interesting times, to say the least. Last 18 months, uh, in particular, have brought about uh, a new set of challenges, has brought in a new set of uh, rules, has shattered some of the standard organization uh, methodologies and processes and things that were taken for granted are no more. What I see as a challenge is that unfortunately the financial people at the helm of uh, all major companies have started to like this. Uh, so this is not going to go away. This is now a way of life. The, the screw will be tightened one notch every year and uh, we will continue to see Jews being taken out uh, out of uh, organization because during these times of recession, some tough decisions have been taken uh, to realign, restructure. E every kind of business that is uh, going to survive has gone through this process. To restructure, reduce costs, uh, take out unnecessary things, take out perks, and uh, even forego salary increases. IBM did uh, proceed with salary increases, but uh, they are far different from what it used to be. We have hired in uh, uh, certain growth, growth markets and, and geographies because of the strategy that we adopted just prior to this uh, uh, recession uh, and the uh, downturn that hit us uh, in 2008. At that time, IBM divided the worldwide market into two segments. One is the growth market, uh, markets that were growing uh, double digit, 10% or more. And then there is a set of mature markets, very big market for IBM, which is uh, almost 65%, 68% uh, of total IBM business. But that is growing uh, 1, 2, 3%, like the US or, or Europe or Japan and so on. And the example of growth markets is uh, countries like Pakistan, uh, uh, Russia, uh, Brazil, India, China, the, the BRIC uh, countries. So all these were batched together with a headquarter in Shanghai. Uh, everybody, all these countries in a bunch reporting to Shanghai eventually. Uh, and not to the US anymore, and not to Europe anymore, which was uh, the uh, previous 70, 80 years tradition. When I joined IBM 32 years ago, we were always reporting either to Paris or to Milan or to the last 10 years to Vienna. So these headquarters don't exist anymore. My headquarters is Dubai. Uh, the headquarters of Central and Eastern Europe, Middle East and Africa is also Dubai. This is a paradigm shift and Dubai no longer reports uh, to some headquarters in Europe. It reports to Shanghai. Uh, double digit mindset, double digit growth and the leaders from the double digit country. So this is uh, one set of actions that, uh, that Coming back to um, uh, home, Pakistan, uh, I think the uh, last two years have been uh, very challenging. Uh, but we managed to uh, grow our business. Uh, we, for 50 years in a row, were the best performing country in MENA. And that wasn't difficult when Pakistan was growing in terms of 5 to 7 percent GDP. Uh, that is the golden period I call 2003 to 2007, something like that. And then we started to falter somewhere in 2007. And 2008 and 9 are there before you, where we had GDP growth of uh, probably uh, below 3%. And in these times, uh, every every company uh, suffered a bit, uh, some more, uh, others less. And uh, uh, I will share more later on, but let me just uh, give one one example. That uh, A book that I read, and some many of you would have read it, uh, the book is uh, titled, uh, Who Moved My Cheese? The idea is that you are used to a particular kind of business, a particular kind of segment. Uh, for IBM, banking is the banking was the uh, bread and butter uh, for business. But in 2008 and 2009, especially in 2009, banking started to tank. So what did we do? Uh, first of all, we started new lines of business, and I'll talk about that uh, later. And we moved into segments that we had not done business with the past eight or nine years for they were risky pieces of business, doing business with the army, with the BTCL, uh, where long delays and complications are there, you don't get your money. 
but and in telecom, telecom was a sector that we had undertaken. So uh, we changed our strategy. We moved into these new businesses. We kept our presence in the banking sector, and hopefully, banking sector will recover in 2011. I don't see a major recovery in 2010, apart from other banks which have that long of purchases. So I will talk more when we when we get into the discussion. But this is how overall uh, we changed our strategy. And um, uh, we were again uh, successful. So, as a group, if we can identify some core challenges and then also discuss some core ways of tackling those challenges, it's not enough just to identify the challenges, but we need to come up with some solutions as a group. Um, and I know that Ravi is going to be documenting this and publishing this and sharing this on a much wider uh, audience. So I think we're really here to sort of brainstorm, share our experiences, but to come up with something concrete. I'm very delighted to be here among all the dignitaries all over Pakistan and abroad. I want to go back to the context that was put together very nicely by Rabia. In that context, she talked about, in one of the opening sentences, she talked about the industry growth back. First of all, what is industry? So that we can understand what could be the road map. Okay. What is the nature of the least work that is called industry? Um, very likely, I want to take it as IT industry as general as possible to include everybody that has to do anything in the IT, just for the sake of continuing the discussion. Seven important imperatives that we need to look at that if we miss Obviously, we will be doing some kind of a disservice to the industry. Obviously, we will not be able to reach where we want to be. And where we want to be is something we can let you decide or discuss. Number one, there is need for a paradigm shift in the business. The business today do not take IT as the enabler. They talk about it, but when they are sitting in the lunchroom, IT is just a cost. That paradigm shift is required at the business side. We, the IT experts, we uh, at the hands of CISO and CIOs and uh, handling the programs and all these things, uh, can influence very little on these things, but collectively we can influence a lot. Um, second thing is there's a need for excellence in leadership, specifically for IT, and there's a reason for it because not every CSS officer can be a CIA. You cannot just put anybody give them a crash course of six months and put them into uh, a CIO for a large organization. I don't know if somebody has been probably very successful in venture, but quite frankly, in my 18 years of experience, uh, it's a disaster for me. Um, so you've got to have capabilities to collectively build a level of excellence more leadership to understand how they can effectively think and go forward. And understand the dependency of how IT can understand the business value. The third thing is the cross-pollination of ideas among IT leaders, which is this forum. And I appreciate it's the first step. Cross-pollination would mean one thing. For example, I'm here from National Bank. And I'm sure there are people over here who are representing other companies that are service-giving companies in the IT sector, for example. Myself, voice or I just met uh, Ashisa. Um, you know, is here. There has to be a cross coordination of those who are offering the services and those who are consuming the services to really understand where we can meet the business value. That cross coordination sometimes happens through presentations with some technical guys, but that's not enough. And that is sometimes misdirected between the vendor himself does not really understand the true needs of the business because business was not able to articulate those needs. And they've been, uh, there's an expression I learned, I've lived 20 years abroad and I've learned this expression when I came to Pakistan almost a year for a year. Uh, they said, uh, you know, you're putting somebody behind a red light or la 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 so I don't know what that means to you, but I, to me it means that you are uh, putting somebody to say them up for a bit. Uh, number four is the dependency of the industry roadmap is significantly on the industry 
majority profile. How uh, we have CMM as and for that applies to the organization, we're gonna have to come up with some kind of a CMM that is specifically for the industry for us to measure the roadmap. Where are we going? How are we going? How will we know we have these step one, step two, step three, step four, whatever? We also need number five, benchmarking. Ways to implement metrics and measurements. If we have no way of measuring things, we have no way of managing things. If we cannot measure, we cannot manage. Number six, there is again a paradigm shift required in the IT vendor side that I hope I don't offend anybody, that they should be largely focused on the customer value instead of saying this is a wonderful solution and therefore the company should get it. Yes, it's a wonderful solution, but where is the alignment? And that alignment, sometimes, even the purchaser miss or probably have little clue of the true value. So this is where I really hope that vendors step up and do something more to, to help the show the industry. And number seven is the harnessing of human capital. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't think it's going to be a surprise if I say to you that in the next 20 years, the population in other parts of the world is going to decrease significantly. And in Pakistan, it will continue to increase. Uh, currently, the ratio of increment in Europe is around 1.5%. In, um, in North America, it's less than 2%. And uh, we need to look at these things to understand how this whole world is going to shift. There are 9.8 million people in the US that are currently baby boomers, people within the age of, uh, people who were born between 1946 and 64. These people are currently reaching their retirement age, and they will be out of the market. And there is a huge gap that has already started as of last week. That's going to accelerate over the next few years. And it will continue for the next 18 years. Not only for North America, similar things are happening for the Europe. In Pakistan, our growth is continuous. We don't have the same phenomena playing out the way it is being played out elsewhere. So how do we help harness the human capital within Pakistan, mature this industry with a definitive program? These are my submissions. I hope they could be of any value. Thank you very much, uh, Omar's state is my name. I represent an organization uh, that is for international environment effects. It's very difficult to explain what we do, but we do some institutions that actually really work uh, uh, across the globe. In Pakistan, we have been working for over four years now, and Shaz is also on the project in Pakistan. So, uh, a very interesting uh, discussion, and uh, Rabia sent me this invitation, uh, which I saw only sitting at Sambal Airport by flying uh, to Karachi last evening and you know, uh, the taxi, I plugged in my uh, mobile phone with my computer and I accepted it. Uh, so it's really excited uh, to be here. I would try to put things in a little bit different perspective because uh, you guys are technology guys, right? Uh, and we were in, in, in Burban for the last uh, three days and we were discussing uh, this, this phenomenon which I would like to present to you with the uh, 20 meeting chamber presidents uh, for a day and a half, which is the global economic recovery. Uh, okay, Kyagare, as you know, there are this terrorism, there is financial issues, there are all sorts of other problems. Shall we go down to a shop and go back home? Of course not. So, uh, you just said that Pakistan is also only part of economic recovery, and I think it is that the international government is saying that uh, Pakistan. Uh, Pakistan institutions are saying that the economic institutions are saying So let's look at the global economic recovery and its impact that is going to be uh, on Pakistani side. Uh, recession was bad, but this time around we are starting from a much larger base. So in most cases, the manufacturing capacity uh, in terms of the people, uh, so people can start the economy will be much faster. So there will be opportunities for you guys. So please step up and do some more opportunities. The other uh, point that I would like uh, to share with everybody here is the legislative environment in Pakistan. Uh, it's such an important thing and not many people actually look at the level thing which has been legislative environment. We only look at the business perspective. There's a minus of the club, but as you know, one of the strategy was on the lines of businesses. Uh, but what happens to the national line for any other? 
with a large financial institution or a think company, that that was media saying next to me, I'm a junkie, you know, if one of the guys, uh, you know, do something which falls within the uh, end of the type of platform, if I could run it and they can take away all their improvements without giving them copies of their software for the data. Yeah. 
things that are not in place in our organization, but it's a fairly standard practice uh, across uh, international standards uh, in many, many organizations, which, uh, which we are trying as a, as a which I am trying to institute in NID, as well as which is what has been instituted in other domestic Actually, just relating this back to the point we had earlier on benchmarking, because clearly the only way to improve is to compare yourself with other companies and see where you stand. So maybe this could be some area, I don't know if you could share this uh, in some fashion. I think one of the things maybe, uh, I think, that in, uh, which I've faced and worked in many countries, uh, and one of the things in Pakistan, again, is a different way. I think that one of the things uh, for technology, we are very fortunate we have what we call international standards that are published, that are easily available. What I think that when we practice it, we should take those standards, which are policy related or standard related, and we should, it is very simple for us, I, I, I use it simplistic, but to modify to the country's institution and practices. And the way it actually operates. It's, uh, it, uh, it is fortunate technology that you don't have to rethink a lot of this or actually do a lot of this. Uh, but I think the problem is actually in taking it and understanding the complexities of the environment that you are working in and fine tune it to be able to work in this and that, I think, is what uh, we have to, if, as individual CIOs or IT heads or directors or whatever, that uh, we have to look at it logically, look at it in an intellectual fashion, and make sure that it works in the organization. So that doesn't put an onerous uh, task or overhead on your organization and uh, actually end up not enabling you to do your job. So that's, that's what I think that uh, sometimes, and I've been in a couple of uh, discussions in Pakistan, I think uh, people, I think that as organizations, we have to wake up and say there are practices of you know, how to adopt it is just, the, 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 how to adopt it with its nuances is what we have to work on. I'm just trying to develop this theme slightly. Would it be useful if we had somebody take the lead on this and maybe come up with a framework? Like you talked about, like I said, benchmarking is something that clearly is of value to everybody. You know, whatever company you're in, if you can compare yourself with other people, if you can't compare yourself with IBM or Cisco at the moment, the scale is obviously different. But if you can see whether people around you are doing something like this, I, I'll tell you from a, from a person who is a company who is uh, from an IBM or Cisco's perspective, I would wish IBM and Cisco had the open to adopt the international practices dictated by the global office. Because <laughs> that's <laughs> it. <laughs> I don't say too much for us. <laughs> I would really wish that. Uh, because I have, uh, as a person who buys, I work with IBM Oracle in many countries. Okay, and Cisco work in many countries. And I think I've seen in many different countries they practice it. And I would prefer to have uh, a standardized <laughs> I think touche is the answer to that. <laughs> so, point, point well taken. Uh, I'd just like to add uh, uh, another perspective to this involvement of the board and the senior management. I've been in the industry for many years. I remember when we would invite the bank residents or senior people to uh, seminars and conferences. <laughs> They would come and sit in these chairs and ask their IT managers to sit. Uh, they would not talk, they would be hesitant. Just 20 years ago, they would be hesitant. Now, uh, as technology, as automation is uh, becoming part of the business, because in banking, treasury, trade finance, co banking, in uh, telcos, uh, your switches, your billing system, your customer care, you cannot survive without that. Uh, when these are becoming kind of mission critical applications, this thing has automatically uh, gone up to the board. Um, I and my colleagues uh, interact a lot with the board, uh, board members at um, the National Bank, uh, UPL, uh, several other banks. 
I, I sit on the uh, board of one of the banks and I know how what the thinking is there. There isn't enough time. I totally agree with uh, some remarks that you made that the board will But and even in, in the manufacturing and commercial organizations where ERP is stepping in and you cannot run the business. Your business is not dependent. Toyota cannot, in this model, cannot uh, uh, continue to manufacture cars if the system goes down for two hours. So if you have that kind of thing, it is all automatically a matter. But if it is just uh, uh, ordinary application, so we are going through a process. There are dozens of organizations where it has happened, but a lot more is needed. We are running a mission critical ID. What we do uh, for major ID decisions is that uh, we go to our ID steering committee. It comprises of board members, the CIO, and the experts from the industry. And we want to make the decision. So we have the representation from the board, the senior management uh, of the company, and ID experts from the industry. Uh, my name is Rizwan. I'm the director of Zambia. And South uh, is excluding India. Um, I just like to make few comments on the discussion. Okay. I'll start with the benchmarking. So benchmarking is a, it's a good thing, but I mean, in my experience, what I've observed, not just in Pakistan, but because I've worked in Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, and all these countries, is that it's a good thing to say that okay, yes, we should do the benchmarking, or we should see that what other organizations are doing. But there is training happening in that way. Because most of the time what I've seen is that we always have to point out that we are not like them. We are different. So what we need is different. Yes, uh, it's UBL versus NPP. But in UBL things happen differently and NPP is different. So they do compare. But when it comes to the acquisition and all these things, it shouldn't come back to the simple question or the simple statement of that we are different. So we need to do things different. And if I add to what Mary said about IBM and the other in terms of uh, bringing the international practices, this is another thing which I've noticed. That this gets related to the same as benchmarking. You know, that we always look for the best application available in the market, the best solution available in the market. But what I've seen most of the time happen is let's now tune it, change it, customize it as what we want. So even the best practices or the best solutions which the customers tend to acquire because they want to implement something uh, based on the best practices, they always get customized to that we want to do it our way. And we want to do it our way because our way is different from others. So yes, you can always tell us that okay, uh, you can compare or benchmark with another organization, but we are not there. So that I think is one major problem because uh, this is I think that we need to address as well. In terms of that, uh, when we talk about roadmap and everything, uh, we talked about earlier, Rabia spoke about whether do more with less, yes, or even how this thing is adding in value to top and bottom line. Now, to measure this, those results as well, or to look at that thing, I think the bottom line is that how we do it. The customers, even the organization being fast, how we do it. Whatever the solution we are required or the best practices we require, are we doing it in the same way as what we thought of at the time of acquisition? So we decided to go with the best code banking solution in case of a bank. But are we really implementing that best code banking solution in the way the vendor told us to? Because we ultimately end up doing so much customization that it becomes your own solution. And that I think is the problem even in terms of best practices, that when it comes to best practices, so yeah, this is a good best practice. I agree that we need to have CMM and all these things to see that how mature we are, how best we are doing things. But we will always get to the idea of modifying. Give us a few minutes of it to be able to see that to sort of interject into this point. It's very interesting. I've been listening to the last thing. This is a good problem that we have. We always have to I believe five years that that's what we did five years the first job in Pakistan. Very interesting job. I came from outside. The way we work out there is not the same here. Everything's changed upside down. I see my problems basically is the business strategy. Unless the business is it? Business strategy.
actually, I cannot work. I cannot work. That's the first thing I, I don't get. Is it IT enabler? Yes, it is IT enabler, because IT is pushing them. Sometimes it's just a little bit of IT is working. IT is just a little bit of 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 I mean, you must make a decision that that the cost of the money. This is my problem that I have. This is my greatest problem I've seen so far. The second problem I've seen is people who are talking to the question. I was talking to the question. In power, do we are people to make decisions? No, we don't. I am the boss. You must say, you must control the idea to work. Do we have to make a decision? Most of us don't do that. Why not? Why don't we empower people to make decisions? Let them be accountable. Accountability is not there half the time. I'm running a IT shop about 240, 240 people are getting that kind of time. I have to make sure that I'm not the only one who's sitting out there and get some people who are accountable for certain things. I have to make sure of that. I'm saying, I have to make sure people engage with my business. Why engage my business when I do my budget? Do I do that? No, if I don't, then I have a problem right now. The thing is, because the end of this is a big high level that's what we do in the boardroom and all that. I can't go to the boardroom if I don't have a strategy in place. I can't go to the boardroom. So I have to make sure that these things are in place. I have to challenge the business to make a decision. I have to do that as IT because I know that technology is being come, is coming out there. I know exactly what can how can help my business. I know that. But I have to at the same time engage my business at the same time also. So this is what I my challenges are in this organization. To make sure that I can I can do this, I can make my my very successful. Secondly, I have I have I'll share this with you, share with you share with you. Some reason to share with you. I was very surprised when I heard that I was a software CEO. Yeah, in order to be a CIO, you have to be a computer graduate. This was this was I heard that I was, I was laughing at saying, where did you come up with this environment from? You're telling me this from where? Because I, I've worked in places where a person who's a computer science major and he's he's sadly in front of CIO, a CIO, a CIO. We have the amount of thinking. We still we still that in the old world that you said just a computer graduate, you can't be a computer work in the computer science department. Unless you are graduate, unless I have 20 years of experience today, I cannot get a job because I have a degree. Why? Where is that? What is the more? We are saying in, the, in those words out there, you come out and break those words. You will not be successful as an organization unless you don't those words. I'm sorry to say that, but I have five years have been very challenging for me. You know? I have tried my best at UDL to change the mindsets. And it has worked. It has worked, but everyone has to try that to break the mold outside so people at the bottom level can come up and be better decision makers. This is what our challenges are. Once we come up, overcome all these problems, then we can become successful as a banker, as an IT guy, and everybody else. This is what our challenges are. Let us announce ourselves from Anglo. I know that Anglo has done some wonderfully innovative technology integration into its four businesses. Do you see the ROI? Is the technology investment actually paying off? And how do we convince of that ROI? I was hearing comments from various uh, analysts over here, and one of the main ones that I heard about was the lack of uh, bias strategy uh, at the board level. And uh, I'd like to address that with the uh, Coupled with the ROI question here. Ebro is a very futuristic looking company, very aggressive, and it's doing much about the market development organization. I mean, in Pakistan's environment, especially in the recession and marketplace today, despite all the challenges. And I believe one of the focus and one of the reasons for our success is our bottom line focus on our costs and the fact that whatever we do, it has to add value and it has to be aligned with the business functions. So, when we talk about uh, ROI, nearly every decision we make uh, has some meaning and it adds bottom line value. If it does not add bottom line value, it just won't be right. It does not make any sense. So. You talk about the fact that you already have a strategy in place for your business. Here, right? That's how you actually step in and say this is how an ISOIT strategy is. That's probably because Enro's run in a fashion where all that is very well part of the nature. Could it be that uh, what is now, uh, that our first business strategy in clarity now, how do you think you might respond to that? I would definitely say that if we go in clarity in any way, so we would have to respond differently. However, to get to where there is clarity, we would have to work. I mentioned, there was a mention of the challenges of our years. I was with another financial institutions. 
I faced the same challenges. And I believe it is because people before me, at least in my position, did a lot of work. So I stand literally on the shoulder of giants, as Dr. Lee has to say, to bring the organization to a place where the organization understands that IT is an enemy. Uh, on the flip side, IT has also demonstrated in the past that whatever it does, it does also comes back and adds value. And it does, it does offer innovations also. So when on the IT side, if I look at it, there's one operational side, which just runs a day-to-day -day -day operation, which we call keeping the lights on. And the other side is purely about sitting with the business, talking to them, finding out what is it they need for tomorrow? Where are they going? What are the business plans? And I think that's where the biggest disconnect comes in. Majority of the CIOs over here, or at least at least I can speak for myself when I was in the financial industry and for a couple of months before when I, when I was in the manufacturing industry, are not actually working as CIOs, they are basically CTOs. So when you are doing technology, you really cannot talk strategy. You can there is just not enough hours in a day to look at operational excellence, ensure that the lights are running, when your lights are on all the time at the minimum cost. And you know, there are no complaints and so on and so forth. While talking about people's aspirations, guiding them, discussing different different alternatives, I mean, one person or even a group of people uh, can't do it unless those roles are clearly demarcated. But if you have been made the CIO because of the fact that you have a computer science degree, <laughs> and the expectation be indeed, gentlemen, okay, you would actually be acquired by you. Must be you use your background or not, I, and I agree with that. I think that's where the challenge comes in that we put the wrong person in the wrong place. Uh, that's where the wrong person ended up at, 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 at the top of the pedestal and asked the person to deliver on something that the person was never equipped to do. Uh, from my perspective, when we talked about, as you mentioned about uh, you know, on, on the leadership side and the bottom up growth that we should go on, I mean, from, from the bottom up, my view is that the CIM should be a business oriented person should be a person, and Engel has demonstrated that our past CIOs have gone on to become CEOs of our affiliates. So it's not as if we are living proof of that paradigm. This is not theory. This is practice, this is practice and we have been practicing it for the last 15, 20 years. That our senior management people actually rotate. Our, or on our next level of people are the people who actually keep the lights on and who actually do the work. But from a senior manager management point of view, there are the people who understand the business, who have been in the trenches, who have grown up their sleeves, who know what, what works, what doesn't work. So when they come to the IT side or any other any other service side, they know exactly where to cut cost and what to do to add value on So after CIO to IT, not from your IT team, he's not been the, the chief programmer or something like uh, I am actually fulfilling that role today. I am actually one of the most, uh, I've actually made the break from the norm in in Ingo. And the reason for the break from the norm was that a previous person was actually a person who was an engineer and uh, who was our main facility was at is at Harky. So he was there. He had to leave and they had to bring in and bring in myself. I come from a pure uh, technology background, although I have uh, financial uh, degrees and everything and understanding of that uh, of that side also. But I am you can call it in the last 10, 15 years actually more, I'm one of the aberrations. I just have one more to ask the best question because I know Shari also wants to ask a question. In uh, Since Samatsa was here at 9 o'clock, we decided to have a chat about people and the culture of CIOs in Pakistan, whether they are decision makers or whether they're still pitching, as, as you said, Mary, uh, pitching technology or a solution to the board and trying to get ownership. Is it the other way around? Or are you part of the team that actually makes the decision? my test from the decision point of view. Endorsement is obviously a senior level. So if something goes wrong, they, all, they cannot go to anybody else except me to ask, why did that decision, I mean, why did you take that decision? However, uh, the final endorsement is with them because they, they eventually they control the persons. And it's, it, for them, it has to make value from the point of view that if I'm asking them to spend X million rupees uh, today, uh, will, will they agree with the business owner? Does it, does it business My point was that you know, a lot of strategies, in fact, all these strategies are actually developed at the board level. And the level of interaction, I have board members across Pakistan, because the board most to at least 50% of the company that I've been interacting with. Board key knowledge was in a lot. I mean, 
and that's the reality. That's something which we all should appreciate and understand. So, if I, uh, you know, Tango is an exception because you know the kind of dynamic leadership they have, there are very few exceptions. Uh, but I think, uh, in my opinion, the, the point I want to make was that if you really want to bring about a strategic change, you have to educate the board members. And the challenge is that the board members meet only four times a year, three to four hours each meeting so for them to actually understand what blah 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 you talk is very difficult. Engaging with them otherwise as well because most of them um, are free social people, uh, you know, they are there to understand. But they don't understand because a lot of people don't try to uh, you know uh, develop a vanilla flavored plain word uh, explanation for them. Uh, the same that we had, uh, CIO was uh, the lead partner in that Pasha the awards uh, we had last time, and I was sitting at the table with uh, three three senior board members, and they were all like oh, fantastic. We created a software and us too, but you oh, must invest in this. I said, can is new, but you have to actually come out and you know open up your pockets and invest into it. But the amount gas here, but the problem is we don't understand this. And there are people who are you know, board members running their companies. So the challenge here is for all of us and those who are not around us is to educate the board members. The strategy will always come from the board. Do not do the, the implementation part. See, whatever the best effects are, you know, they are accountable to make them accountable. This is this. I mean, as Baba Sahib and Ahmed Sahib from the media. I would like to add something, a real example. Just about the things, the board members things, uh, in the industry for our materials, you know, the material now and the the companies. There's one thing to like to add on the things, innovations. There are many people that say he was so very bright and innovative into the things. They definitely like to bring the new technologies into their organizations. But when it goes to the board members, the one remark which I most of the time heard, never heard of it. We don't want to take any of us into that thing. A complete IT team really wanted to have that technology to bring some processes and changes, overall changes into a business from the business perspective. But the board members and the finance, one thing, never heard of it. How many implementations in Pakistan? What are the background of that? So they aren't going to take any risks. Absolutely. Why is it? Why the people, industry in Pakistan, especially the all the Really nice. so it seems to raise the point that they're at the board level. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. There right. is. And there is a good example where we have bypassed the CIO and reached the board, explaining other things and other things. Yeah. I'm just add, uh, because you know, I, I slightly, I have a different, different opinion here. Boards will never have time to sit and hear details. Uh, this is my opinion. Slightly, slightly disagreeing with you. Believe me, uh, I've seen my proposals go to the boards and they are discussed five, ten minutes. Um, it is if the uh, people presenting, the senior management, the president or uh, managing director, and is how convincing they are, what is the ROI, and so on. So I think we need to focus more on the senior management, the, the, the CIO. That is why the CIO needs to be a businessman, so that he can interact with the uh, CFO, with the business head, with the you know treasury head or the manufacturing uh, plant floor uh, manager. So he is the same level, and he can interact with them. And and fortunately, we have many CIOs of tax stature, and they are in this room uh, that they can do that. And and detailed work. If it is a good business case, it comes to the board. They'll spend 10, 15 minutes at most because there are dozens of things to be presented. So yes, once in a while you will go to the board, and boards do form committees uh, to uh, uh, look at solutions and to monitor solutions. And several of the organizations that I work with, I work with the uh, board committees. But the entire board will never be able to. So we need to work with senior management. So at least one strategy is already devised, you know, you know, the way to actually uh, develop and have the strategy implemented. You know, one of the key areas which we were discussing here is 
say, yeah, what channel kya hoga, which channel are you going to use to actually make this thing happen, whatever sort of thing, so one of the outcomes you have already seen. Yeah. My name is Amir Jahangi and I work for Samadhi as CEO and I also uh, by Stanford University on Innovation and Journalism from Africa. And one of the uh, very good suggestions from uh, seven suggestions from Ali and Jamal, uh, I think this really needs a more public focus to be uh, brought out uh, in the media. And unfortunately, when we look at the media, uh, a, uh, except for Rabia and a few other channels, uh, the understanding of information technology, innovation, it is not there. Most of the programs that you see are about gadgets, not the process. processes. So I think uh, I would suggest that uh, from this forum and from uh, in collaboration with CIO, we can start a program for the capacity building of the media professionals to write about uh, the, the issues of, of, of the, the industry and then link it up with, uh, with the, some sort of journalist award for the year. So it will increase the quantum of uh, knowledge and information on these issues. It will be a good source of information for the world and we can share good success stories, we can share some concerns as well. In the and these, so we can develop a platform for journalists where they can develop their content, submit it to maybe uh, a platform created by CIO, and then a panel of judges can select them that these are the people who, are, uh, who have developed good quality content, and then they be acknowledge their contribution accordingly. So it will actually uh, engage uh, the media in terms of increasing public focus on, on the issues. I have a broader audience. Yeah. Yeah. I just like to pick up on yes. this. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm trying to steer the uh, discussion, otherwise we can sort of end the day without too much to do. I think straightforward. This is a very interesting part. I just like to move this forward. What is the case in Pakistan? In all the world, there is a great publication. In Pakistan, the IT industry by now is a billion dollar industry. Or more. We once did a calculation when I was the case in the it's about 1.5 billion dollars if you include training, if you include technology, people's salaries, etc. That's a large size business. Magazine Aati and Jati, if you put a weekly Aati, you can have a lot of things that you can pass on and copy back to the video. I'm not sure Skyo Magazine B uh, to some extent sort of does that. I apologize. <laughs> so, why is it that clearly there's something missing and the problem is the part lies with ourselves. Obviously, this is a magazine, but not a vision of people. If a $8 billion dollar industry can be a magazine, there is something missing in this industry. I will comment on this. The magazine, unfortunately, stays within the industry. The readers of your magazine are not within the IT industry. It's everybody else. Uh, and this is something that we've been talking about, and I really want to get back to the comment you just made. Because at the end of the day, the buyers are not part of the IT industry. They are in food industry, they're in FMCG, they're in banking, they're in health, they're in education, they're in everything else. So that outreach... But what by trade industry publications, you know, they're trading for them. No. And then the development is one more issue. You know, because, you know, again, the side of the market with the economic journalists across Pakistan, right from very small cities to large cities as well. In the journalist community, I think everybody carry very fast because you see, the other journalists have got what they call medical beats. Medical beats means that they have to IT cover their ass, and they have to cover their ass. So, there is a lot of specialization that is not in Pakistan. If you are sitting behind the door, you are sitting behind the door. I mean, he has got so many beats. He is sitting there, he has got a CM hospital, he has got a CM. So, you cannot really focus. What is the other thing? I think there is a need for capacity uh, building for the journalists uh, for this particular uh, sector. And go IT stuff, yeah, it is incentivized in terms of not in cash uh, or memory terms, but in terms of uh, honoring, re recognition, and also uh, when the quantum of information will shift from just from uh, technology to maybe food. Uh, the, uh, maybe, uh, application. Yeah, the application and the processes. 
that will bring a lot of, uh, um, and I would uh, like to connect that uh, with Kravya, uh, and I would like to, uh, I also work with World Economic Forum on the Global Information Technology Index. And I think uh, the missing part is from Pakistan is that most of the data that has been submitted, that is submitted every year to the World Economic Forum and the Rather than Authority, is very important. Just wanted to address the important point uh, that uh, you have raised in terms of uh, the experience versus degree. Obviously, it could be any degree, whether it's in journalism, whether it's in science, or IT, or telecom. Uh, for a CIO, what is more material is the competency and experiences. And that is what I was talking about in my point two in leadership development is that you cannot give somebody a six months introduction of IT and say you don't run it because it's uh, a disaster in me. So that's, so I hope I've addressed that. There is no problem with any sort of degree in the background. I see a dichotomy in this form. And this dichotomy is not new to me. I've been 20 years abroad in North America and that dichotomy existed in the 90s over there as well. I think we need to recognize this dichotomy. We are probably being color branded, and I'm sorry if I've used this word, uh, and I, I don't want to insult anybody, it's just that we are only seeing it in the black and white. The dichotomy of CIO versus CTO, not many organizations in the world have both, okay? You either name that person as CTO or you name that person as CIO. What is required out of that person, whoever that is? To me, this is transparent, whether CTO or CIO. That person must really have a very good understanding of the business and have some background of the business as well as a very poor experience and understanding of IT. And that is how you can build a bridge between the two islands. What was happening in the 90s is CEOs were frustrated because they cannot talk to the IT people. IT people are frustrated because when they talk to business, they are somebody's on Mars, somebody's on Venus. And a CIO is that person who can bring common sense. I think we would look at this milestone that we were discussing today 10 years ago and we recognize the overall global IT industry recognize, forget about it, just move on. Whoever you put that one person on the top at the helm of the fair, that person must understand the business value and must be very savvy in technology, end of the story. Now you can try dicing it, skin, you know, skin the cat in many different ways. I also wanted to share with you the IT strategy part. When I joined National Bank about 10 months ago, ID strategy was missing. We are the probably only, only organization or one of the few only organizations where we have at the board level, IT board committee, out of the board of members, like we have risk committees or audit committees. And I am also reporting to the board committee. I'm also the secretary to the board committee. So I joined, we started talking about strategy in one session early on. I knew we don't have ID strategy. So there's a power in suggestion. And that's what I'm trying to help everybody see. I talked to the chairman and I said, sir, there are a few interesting things mentioned about IT in the business strategy that we have. Wouldn't it be nice if we have a full-blown IT strategy? Thou shall do it. All right? And I said, he said, who's the best candidate to do it? I said, sir, I can do it because I've done it before with Gartner in the past for a bank. And uh, I teamed up with Gartner. We've done it. And I think I can do it again. Get on with this. I got that strategy first phase, we divided it in two stages. First stage, first phase, designed, presented to the steering committee, presented to the board, approved, and into the next phase. You don't have to bleed to really get IT strategy in place. You just need to utilize the power of suggestion. First, business strategy missing. You need to sort of using the power of uh, giving suggestion. Talk to the senior, whoever that is, whoever is uh, synthetic to your views. Talk to them, set up a forum, set up a committee who is going to start talking about coming up with some sort of business strategy or at least defining goals, probably five page goals. And then draw your ID strategy from it and then work on it. For those organizations where ID business strategy is already there and there is a forum of a strategy committee, very simple. You just get on with your ID strategy and as you make your ID strategy in chunks, discuss it with those steering committee because these are members from every business group. Talk to them, talk to their needs, talk to their future needs. Uh, sit down with them on a tea, uh, at a tea break or go to their offices, visit them as often as possible. Get their buy-in, get them to sign off on that strategy. 
Once management has signed off, give it to the board. Have a discussion with the board. You learn and get their buy-in and sign off. Once it's signed off, then we go back and say, guys, let's just move on and we're going to do this. These are my solutions. Uh, the integral part of that group. Um, but I think at least, right, you still need to get that final buy-in. You still need to get that final person on board. So you can lead as a thought leader and employ the power of suggestion as you talked about. Now, one of the things I wanted to actually bring up here was the fact that one of the changes that I've seen in the past five years, you were there in the 90s and Bashan was there in the 90s and the early 2000s. One of the changes that have happened globally is that the CIO today is joined the head of the CFO. He's either reporting as a CFO or he's joined the head. Randy Mott at HP is not reporting in the lot of good. He's reporting to the CFO. Uh, Tom Kushner at Disney is not reporting to, uh, did not report it to Mike Black when he was there. Mike Black actually, you know, forwarded him over to the CFO. You know, and then that, that question around CTO, that actually is happening more along, more on the office of CEO, the Chief Operating Officer. The Chief Operating Officer is combined together with the CTO, and your CIO is sort of put together with the CFO. And that's where the strategy gets here. If in your organization, you have a structure that <clears throat> allows your CIO hand to work with the CFO, then you have some kind of a, a structure that you can work with. Um, I work with several, so just a quick introduction, I actually work with SAP, I, I um, do partner development and ecosystem development. I also volunteer at uh, Open Silicon Valley, which is an organization out there in Silicon Valley. So the, you know, the two or three changes that I've seen happen that I wanted to talk about with you was joining the head of CFO and, and CIO. I personally think that we still need that final buy-in to answer your question. I don't think that, but again, having that structure in place will get you that final buy-in. Every time I presented to any of the, the buyers, CFO wasn't the room. You know, eventually the room, the furniture in the room got directed at that person. That's just how it works. I think that's how it is in Pakistan, but I don't think it's any different. Now, one thing I, I also wanted to address your point, you mentioned something about empowering. The other thing I've seen now in organizations, and when I used to have been before, we also discussed that I've worked with IBM over there as well, is that is the, the sense of clarity. How many CIOs here, for example, have VPs or executive VPs with actual budgets for products, buying products? One, right? Two. Two. Okay. <laughs> So, you know, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I'm just saying, no, in Pakistan, the CIO doesn't need have budget. It's not as well they don't have budget. <laughs> no, no, no. Not the CIO, I mean, the CIO giving the budget to what you say to the VPs and the VPs under him. I have zero budget. You have zero budget. I have zero budget. You mean you're you're under, you're 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 pushing down? I don't want to personally, I've given it to my accounts. <coughs> they control the budget. Like, and they, are, they have ownership for the budget, they have ownership for delivery, and they have ownership. You know, one of the things that's happening also is that there's a, when you do that uh, sort of a, a diversification in your portfolio, in your organization, one of the things that happens also is that the need for clarity, you need clarity at the yes. end of the day, right? So when you hold them accountable, of course, because you need clarity while they're using that budget. You don't want one executive VP going out spending money on one tool and the other executive VP coming in at the end of the year saying, hey, I the same thing for my organization, but it's all the tools. Then you're stuck with two tools that you now have to maintain. So you need an overall strategy. Well, what you need is a, is, is a level of clarity. Now that strategy can come with, with whatever it comes with. Maybe if you go by Oracle, um, you know, Oracle has their own tools that, that they can employ with you uh, to provide you with that, with that clarity. As if you can do the same. Uh, other vendors see. So, the buyers really need to come out and push their vendors saying, um, and I'm stepping on the other side of the table here, but push their vendors saying, we need clarity too. Buy your tool, but we better have some clarity around what this tool is giving me at the end of the day. And unless you have either a tool or some kind of a, a, a program or a strategy that can provide you with that clarity on what you're getting out of that tool at the end of the year, that tool is just going to be a, a gadget or you know, whatever it is that you're using. That's pretty much what it will become. Uh, 
the big cool little thing that will come out, you know, everybody comes out at 5 in the morning, after I'm going to do whatever, use that tool and, and do the usual stuff. But you're not going to be able to get um, the clarity around what that tool does for your organization. Which uh, opinion side are you on, basically, would you, which, with which model do you prefer? Well, I mean, your experience. Yeah, my experience is that, um, at least as a vendor, um, my sales pitches have gone smoother than CIO and CFOs were joining today. So I, the CIO was reporting to the CFO, I had a dotted line to the CFO. Um, but that's really, it is easier to buy because the CFO is engaged in the procurement process because of budgets. But what about the strategy? Because clearly the, C, the CFO does not take strategy for the organization. No, no they, they don't. The but strategy, like what Ali was saying, is that I, I think it's a common practice that you should have a strategy encompasses a period of time, say five years. Any, any organization should have five years strategy. The IT goals, IT strategy, I need to say there are some parts that maybe we can take a lead in. But there are some parts that we have to, uh, there's a business that has to deliver. And in order for the business to deliver, there are some amount of things that we can introduce to show how we can deliver. But we have to, in some ways, IT has to actually help the businesses deliver what they want. Whatever want business value they have. Which is the bottom line. Sure. So that strategy has to be in place. Our, our fiscal responsibility to the bank uh, or to the organization lies in first how do we deliver that under a strategy and a budget. How do we uh, deliver that optimal value at a fair price, how to reduce your operating expenses, all of those are part of your overall strategy. And your, this, your financials are in line with that. So, you know, like I can tell, like I said, my budgets are with my individual owners, but each one of them have got a silo that they work in. So for infrastructure, for example, these are the strategies that I've agreed to them, we must deliver last year's budgeting, which includes some delivery of technology, some reduction in expenses, some improvements in SLA, you name it. There are whole kinds of, of, uh, of strategies that we employ to actually ensure that this is in we should track it. So it's not hard. I think that what we have to do is actually, I think there are some organizations maybe that are not used to I know in my organization they're not used to doing it. But it is a it is a overall method of why how you engineer change in that organization to work in a method which is practical as CIOs for us to deliver what we're supposed to deliver. I think that as a team, I think some of us have said what we have to do. It may be different degrees of how it's done in each organization, but I think we all know where that we have to have a strategy, we have to avoid that strategy, we have to put the compliance with the strategy. Yes, we have board members, business heads who may not understand some of this, but that is our jobs as CIOs to actually make sure that we have, we are able to articulate the message enough that we are able to get what we want. And we won't, we won't uh, succeed all the time, but we will succeed most of the um, I'd like to make a comment on uh, what Marjane just said and what the question that Shana Singh just asked. My name is Intiaz, by the way, I work across Cast Management. Um, and I've been listening to quite a few pointers made across here that um, there's three things that I want to make a point of it. First of all, I'd like the question to ask um, Does IT, can IT drive a business? Now, we know for certain that this, at many organizations, business strategy clearly doesn't exist. Generally, uh, depends on what side the CEO sometimes picks up on, in, especially in the case of small organizations. Large organizations tend to have more concrete frameworks, but then again, things to get a bit on the mood side. You know, I don't feel like doing this. Like someone who just mentioned, they heard of it. Um, that happens quite. That happens quite often. Um, so that's where IT can come in with a major role, in my view, at least. Um, and I will tie this into another comment regarding customization. But first of all, how many of us use informed decision making systems here? Yeah. Um, we've all spent um, millions and millions of rupees to great extent to buy great equipment from IBM, great equipment from HP, lots of software from Oracle, there's, there's loads of Microsoft stuff lying around. How many of us are using IT as a decision making system? 
not to be marginalized, not marginalized banks here, uh, but to be honest, um, I still get calls from three banks on a regular basis every month. Um, Certain credit card I didn't have the founder when you are buying up. You know, this happens so often. It's frustrating. Um, the DNC list we keep hearing of, and I don't want to step into the marketing field here, uh, but there's so much. Once we have informed in decision making system structures, uh, what you can actually do is reduce the cost of doing business, reduce the cost of your cost of marketing. I'm sure mark I'm a marketing person myself. Marketing will hate me when I say cut my expenses. But why is ADC, for example, just recent case in point, just talking about all these people? Give me so I will be able to Why are they just cutting everyone? And why are they using the system to pull out and identify who streams it? Say art crore where TV advertising the first error. There's so much less money you could use, um, so much money you could use more effectively using a system, using infrastructure to actually a cross sell products for banks specifically and for other services companies, um, and also um, to start customers start analyzing customer trends. We don't do that at all here. Um, financial institutions, anticipated um, domain, but every every investment company can use those. Uh, banks are now uh, recently past few years now coming up with. Uh, these risk management softwares, uh, Amazon has been providing them with a couple of other brands going with some other companies. Um, but there's very limited decision making system now. State bank is, I think, to an extent, is stepping in, but there's only very skeletal structures given by the state bank. Banks love to say that state bank are mandated, state bank need to get The state bank just provides a bad in my view. Uh, but yes, I agree with someone uh, with the gentleman over there from UBL saying, you know, why does state bank have to say that you don't, CIA has to be graduate? So CIO has to be, in my view, a business strategy person. It will come always from understanding what values you can deliver to the business and what value you can reap from your information. We are not, in my view, utilizing our information. We are just managing like the gentleman is it, keep the lights on, minimal cost. Um, we are not innovating. Uh, we are maybe innovating by buying fancy toys. I hate to say this, but there's, there's, there's too much fancy toy buying and there's too much money being spent on heavy infrastructure and heavy software. Um, versus utilizing that information, sitting down, mapping that out, and start analyzing what's going on. There's so many metrics right there in front of you which you need to use. Another point, Jeremy uh, just made here regarding customization. Um, now, if I were buying a car, I can be customized to like, some extent, you know, seating, data, this, tire, data, this, stuff like that. Um, but the biggest and currently the most powerful organizations in the world, companies like Google, companies like Facebook, I'm sure they don't have positive capital that Google really does. Uh, there's so many companies that rely on information alone. Um, anything that's anything to do with information um, is always more better when it can be customized. I would not say customized to an extent, customized to a certain level. Mm -hmm. You and I will always have different needs about certain things. Um, Google makes just some of those reading couple of days, but Google makes like 200 or 300 changes to the search engine algorithm every year. So every time you are uh, Doing a search, you are getting some test pair of the other, maybe multiple ones. So, when, whenever you deal with information, everyone has a different way of looking at it. We're not saying change the processing algorithm. We're just probably just saying the only, the only customization that most people require are either changes to processing algorithms for legal purposes, A, which is very valid, or for audit purposes, because naturally, what some of the US account, accounting standards in the US may allow me not the same in Pakistan. Um, maybe then I have a question to ask vendors. Um, are they in a position to create those changes on an annual basis? Because I would assume that an organization would make a, a change in its process or framework based on feedback by like their internal customers or external investors. Yes. Okay. So, can I interject? What is this? We seem to be going off and yes. given my sort of current responsibility. <laughs> Uh, and need to make sure that yeah, in the day some sort of uh, touching with a lot we talked about, we've uh, touched upon a number of issues. Uh, I've taken a few notes here. What I thought we could do is we break for a few minutes, we come back, because we're supposed to finish our talk today, which is not too much more to go. And then perhaps when we come back, we can talk a bit about a few more focused topics and see what recommendations we could have that perhaps the yeah, magazine could take away and come back over the course of the next few months and see whether we could do anything. Is that sort of <laughs> yes, essentially, um, we all seem to be very certain about the fact that we have frameworks and within organizations, what the structure should be, who the CIO should report to, so on and so forth. I think if, as experts here or as business decision makers and leaders here, if you could kind of extend that 
and say this is how we drive the market. And I've had the same kind of situation, same kind of process framework, suggest that for the market itself. How do you grow the market size? How do you make sure that you know, there's more revenue to be, to be earned? Because over the course of time, there are a lot of business dynamics which will continue to change, some which will open up, some which will um, increase the amount of competition which, that, which uh, customers as well as vendors, buyers as well as vendors have. And I think that's what I now would like the, the focus to be so we both of you could drive that. Can I just add some more thing? I think what Shahan had said earlier regarding ecosystems is really important to advise your thoughts on as well, which is um, how do we develop those ecosystems? What are the ecosystems we need to recognize them? Uh, because the, the ecosystem itself has a lot to contribute towards the bottom line for all 